So looks like we are ready to get started with our panel of tax talk for members of the adult industry, content creator community, um, all around badass people. So we have complicated tax situations. So we have some experts here to help us out. I'm your host, Lotus Lane. I'm the industry relations advocate at Free Speech Coalition. And um, we have Jesse Hornby, Nerds for Numbers, who is a bookkeeper and Lauren Fumagali, I hope I said that right. Who is a, <laughs> I know I didn't practice that beforehand. Who is a veteran performer, Cherry Ferretti, and has also been a tax preparer for many years as well. And also very savvy, got her taxes done already, performer, model, and president of Ayla, Mary Moody here to kind of help us understand how to be so organized as her and already have your shit together with your taxes. So yeah, um, let's start with Jesse. Why don't you introduce yourself and a little bit of understanding what you do for people like us. Uh, my name is Jesse. I own Nerds for Numbers. I handle the bookkeeping. So I like to think that the, the big difference between a tax preparer and a bookkeeper is you give the tax preparer the information. I'm as the bookkeeper would go through every transaction that you have to kind of figure out what deductions that you have on a transaction by transaction basis, instead of like looking at it as an over the whole year sort of thing. And then also I'm able there to be there to bounce off questions that you have throughout the year. Like if you're in the dressing room and it's 1am and you and you know, your other sex worker friend are discussing mileage rates and you need somebody to back you up on your decision making, you can just shoot me a quick text and I can be that person for you. Sweet, sweet. And with Lauren, um, you know, full tax preparer, what, what do you do as far as helping people get their shit together? <laughs> well, I also do bookkeeping as well, um, but my main focus is actually preparing the tax returns at the end of the year. Um, I help a lot of clients get established with their businesses apply for EINs, apply for loans, do all of that. Um, I'm also a financial advisor, so I can assist them um, with making the best decisions for themselves for saving for the future. Um, and yeah, I've been doing this for 16 years and help studios, performers, all sorts of interesting characters along the way. Um, so I just, I'm kind of the go-to girl. If somebody has a financial question, they call me, so. <laughs> That's very, very good to know. And Mary, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. I am Mary Moody. I've been an adult performer for over five years. And not to brag, but this year my accountant said I was his most organized client. <laughs> I, I referred another friend to him and he told them, oh, Mary is literally perfectly organized. And I was like, oh, I'm going to brag about this forever. Uh, I have to. That's <laughs> So yeah, uh, I have a lot of experience just uh, making mistakes in trying to file my taxes for years. Uh, so hopefully my experience can help someone. Cool, very cool. Right on. So one of the first things, um, because a lot of us are going through the process of getting our PPP loans, especially through FSC, um, PPP, the Blue Acorn site that kind of opened it up the floodgates for um, people of the adult industry to get their PPP. PPP loan. There was a lot of questions about the prurient sexual nature clause that was used by the SPA or SBA, excuse me. And also uh, people were kind of wondering how do they keep track of their transactions in order to uh, qualify for the forgivable part of the loan, the most important piece. <laughs> um, yeah, you're all shaking your heads. Uh, Lauren or Jesse, who wants to take this first? Jesse can start and I'll fill in if there's anything if she wants. Sure, sure. <laughs> so uh, the period nature thing um, is self-reporting. And so you kind of have to make that decision by yourself. However, there is multiple lawsuits going on across the country and different circuit courts, which is a different court in each state or a group of states, um, is making different decisions about that period nature. And it does not seem to be going in the SBA and government's favor overall for that sort of clause. So my suggestion would be, you know, wherever you feel comfortable. Um, I haven't heard of anyone being in trouble for claiming the purient nature clause yet. Um, and then, you know, as you know, it's on the FSC or FSC website, 
applying for the PPP. So um, it sounds like you guys are also indicating that that's probably something that you could just move past. Uh, for the forgiveness, you're going to want to spend at least 60% of your loan on your payroll. And it's going to be imperative that you keep track of that somehow, um, either vis-a-vis -vis, uh, bookkeeping app or keeping exact documentations of transfers in and out of your business account is how I'm having my clients do it. Um, so that way you're having that transaction that you can see when you submit for your forgiveness and it's just one easy transaction and you don't have to worry about a ton of bookkeeping with that. Sounds good. Lauren, did you want to add anything on to that? Um, no, she actually did a really good job of explaining it. Um, part of the other part of it though is yes, yeah, 60% needs to be um, towards a um, owner's draw towards yourself. Um, but you can also use your PPP loan for rent, utilities, et cetera, especially with so many people having a home office deduction this year with COVID going on and everything. Um, those are also um, expenses that qualify for loan forgiveness. Awesome. Um, speaking of home office, we all pretty much use our home as our office, whether it be our studio space or, you know, computer, our own bookkeeping um, for our things that we're constantly having to mail out or take in. Um, what, what is the rule? How, what are the, what are the rules for the home office deduction? Um, let's just go into that. Like, is there a certain square space that, that is needed for it to qualify or certain uh, items or receipts needed? So this is actually something Jesse and I were talking about on the phone prior to this. Um, there's a lot of misconception um, about it being a partition in a certain area of a room or of the home, so you're in a studio apartment or something, um, that is not necessarily the case. Um, the way the IRS observes a home office deduction is a square footage of the space that you perform the majority of your business. Um, so let's say I'm a cam girl and I use my bed. Um, <laughs> we can actually take the square footage of your bed according to the square footage of your home as a whole. Um, or, you know, I use my office here for my taxes and as well as camming sometimes. So I actually write off my entire office in here um, for that. Um, and you basically take it as an indirect expense for your entire home. Um, so say you pay rent, you pay utilities, all of that. Um, on the home office deduction form, it will excuse me, calculate the percentage of your square footage of your actual location based on your whole home. And then it'll account for the credit um, against all of your expenses for the entire home for that year. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Um, uh, Mary, so for your situation, um, for your home office, is it just one room that you use or is part of it your living room or, you know, do you literally measure the area space with measuring tape? <laughs> so I did not measure at all. Um, and I kind of just estimated, but mm -hmm. I rented a house in, I moved to LA uh, in early 2020 and I rented a house to make a, one of the guest rooms, like a filming room. And then I have another room that is all of my storage related to my job and also where I do my makeup and get ready for work. Uh, and then I stream out of my living room every day. So for me, it's basically half the house is yeah. Yeah. like, yes, the living room's like a little, you know, I use it a little bit for personal, but my equipment that you guys saw me moving around earlier is all yeah. stored in my living room 24 seven. Yeah, you're so, in your living room right now. Yeah, I told my accountant, uh, half my rent and he went great that sounds good <laughs> yeah, sounds good yeah. all right yeah just to get an idea of how to really apply that for ourselves that sounds good um jesse did you have anything that you wanted to add about that the home office deduction? So there's, there's a couple things that i want to cover about the home office deduction and one is that every cpa and tax repair is going to have a little bit of a different idea around what qualifies as a home office um, so the exact language that the IRS uses is it must be an exclusive use of the portion of the home conducting business on a regular basis. So the exclusive use clause kind of gets a uh, little pu pushed and pulled 
depending on your tax preparer. But if you really feel that that qualifies as a home office deduction, fight for it. Like if you feel like there's any deduction that you have that is for your business and your tax preparer can't give you the reason or legal precedent that they feel that you're wrong, there are forms that they can hand you that you can sign and say, hey, I, as the person who's taking this deduction, feel like it's a, a necessary and reasonable deduction. And then the, the tax preparer can sign off their audit. Uh, Lauren, can you- it's, it's a due diligence checklist that we do. And so if anything seems inconsistent and correct, or if we advise our clients like, hey, we're not really comfortable with doing that in our due diligence uh, checklist, we can actually put in there that we advise them not to. So our licenses aren't liable. Um, but there's lots of ways around it. I mean, like she said, every tax person has their own cadence and way of handling everything. Um, I got my enrolled agent status with the IRS. I have asked a million questions with the IRS, specifically with sex workers. That was a big question, especially with the home office deduction. Um, and yes, like Jesse and I were saying, the partition isn't necessary and you can totally estimate the square footage. You don't need to get a ruler or a measuring tape out and measure the exact square footage. You can kind of guess. Sweet. And, then, and then on top of that, just a little bit more with that Lotus, I wanted to say, so I know that some people do their own taxes and they don't go to a tax repair. If you didn't keep track of all of your rent and utilities and home office deduction, there is also a basis which is $5 a square foot for business use that you can use if you didn't do a great job with tracking your expenses. However, I think this goes to the point where it is important that you find people who are knowledgeable in your industry so you don't have to fight so much for those deductions that you deserve. Right, people like yourselves, <laughs> people <laughs> that work with people like us. That makes complete sense. Yeah, because there's also, a, I know that there's a lot of fear sometimes among sex workers about finding a tax preparer because they feel that's like completely outing themselves or putting themselves at risk for, you know, being scrutinized or audited in some extra kind of way. So you're very right to look for people familiar with what we do. Yeah. Oh, and if I could add for me, um, well, I moved to Los Angeles, which made it a lot easier to find an accountant who was comfortable with my job. But the first question I ask is, I'm a sex worker. Are you familiar with deductions I can use? And luckily my accountant went, oh, escorting or porn. Oh, <laughs> so I was like, great. He doesn't, you like anything I do, he'll be happy. But I just upfront say like, I work in the adult film industry. Can you help me get like very specific write-offs to help me? And if they're like, maybe, then I just move on. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're completely right. That That's good advice to ask, just be direct. So that way you can know who you're working with and they know as well. Um, let's see, another question would be the self-employed qualified sick leave and qualified family medical leave. Um, is that something that can apply to people in our industry with our kind of independent work? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so because everybody who gets a 1099, according to the IRS, is technically a self-employed individual. Um, and even if you have a single member LLC, which we can talk about business structures later because I know Jesse wanted to touch base on that. Um, even if you're a single, uh, excuse me, single member LLC, it's still all reported as self-employed income on a Schedule C. Um, so the self-employed qualified sick leave um, that is if somebody had to take off time due to COVID, um, if they contracted COVID, there are limitations on that. We can get into that, but it's really boring. Um, and same thing for the qualified uh, family leave. Um, they give you, I believe it's 50 days for the family leave and 10 days for the sick leave. Um, and they basically take a percentage of your income for the whole year. And there are limitations with that. I think the limitation for the sick leave was like $511 a day. And then for the family, it was like 200 and 260, I believe. Um, but yeah, so you do qualify for that completely if you did have to take off time for your family or for being sick yourself or taking care of somebody who was sick um, during COVID. Um, and it's a great, actually <laughs> really nice deduction to have or credit to have, excuse me. Um, for this year, because I know a lot of people were struggling and did have to take time off of work. Yeah. 
that's good to know. Um, yeah, so speaking of structures of corporations, many of us had to do the LLC, S Corp, C Corp situation, especially here in California. Um, what are some things that people need to know about filing their taxes for the first time as their LLC or for the first time as their S Corp? Or, um, you know, in Jesse's case, what are the things they need to keep track of now? So I'm so just to be clear, I don't know a ton about the LLC and S Corp formations. That would definitely be more of a Lauren question. <laughs> but the parts that I wanted to touch on were getting your EIN so that way you can get your business bank account and registering with your state and local business associations or businesses. So that way you can make sure to get all of those grants because a lot of what we do is art. And so we qualify for a lot of art grants. If you're registered like here in the city of Portland, we had a Prosper Art Grant, which was only qualified if you had registered pre-COVID with the city of Portland. And you could have qualified as a dancer or you know performer of some sort. And nobody had registered for their their you know, city license because people don't think about it. And it's free to register for your city license and it's free to register for your EIN. Your state usually costs somewhere between 50 to $250 depending on your state. But that opens you up so, for so many more grants and so many more ways to be legitimized and get those things that everybody else is getting even if you are a sex worker. And getting that business bank account allows you to attach those pay apps and it looks less suspicious for activities that's going into your business bank account than your personal bank account. Also, if they seize your account, which we all know happens on occasion because things are assholes, then you can uh, be like, oh, well, my business money is in this account. It's not attached to my personal account. I even suggest that you get them at two different banks. So that way, if it happens, they're two separate things and you're not getting all of your life seized, which is terrifying. Yeah, no, totally. That's a really good tip. Two different banks, not the same one. Um, completely good advice because I never even thought about that myself with the whole licensing with the city and the state. Um, Lauren, um, did you have something to add to, on that as far as the business structure for LLCs, S Corps, and what people may need to know for filing their taxes as the first time as not an individual, but their, their company? So um, if you do obtain an EIN and you want to go ahead and um, file for an LLC, you do have the option to opt in as an S Corp. And I'll talk about that in a second. With the LLC, though, being a single member, it will still be reported on your income, just as if you're still self-employed. So you can have all of your 1099s go directly to your EIN number with your business name and everything like that. But it still will reflect as if it is completely self-employed income. Um, and then with the S Corp opt-in, you do have to file quarterly um, and you do have to pay yourself out with payroll. So it's a little bit more stressful for most people um, because there's a lot more work involved, but it does give you a lot more, um, excuse me, <clears throat> a lot more abilities and you know your liability is a lot lower if you're running it as an S Corp than just self-employed. Um, you're able to qualify for different insurances that you wouldn't be able to do if you were just self-employed, even if you are just a single member LLC. Um, so, you know, say, God forbid, something horrible happened and you had business insurance on yourself. Um, you can't get that as being self-employed the way that you can with your S Corp. Um, but you do have to file quarterly and you do have to um, pay yourself out payroll as well, being an S Corp. But then at the end of the year, you get a K-1 that all your 1099s get run through your S Corp uh, tax return. So you're, you'll have to do an S Corp tax return and then your personal tax return to reflect the profit and loss from your um, S Corp. That makes sense. So. Yeah. And yeah, it looks like you, did you have something to add, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> question for Lauren that I get from a lot of clients. Um, is there an amount that you would advise that they would start to switch to an S Corp from a sole proprietor? I know that's a hard question, but I mm -hmm. think people jump the gun a little bit too much on the S Corps and then have to worry about dissolving it. And it costs a lot of money to form an S Corp and there is a lot of paperwork that goes with it. And I think some people don't realize that it's, it's a whole process. You're becoming a whole business. Mm -hmm. and it's an entire entity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there isn't really 
an amount that it's like, oh, okay, you make, you know, $250,000 a year. Now it's definitely time to file an S Corp. It's more of a personal preference. Um, usually if I see people making, you know, at least a hundred thousand dollars, I usually advise them just to go ahead and, um, not file quarterly, but make estimated quarterly payments. Um, even if they are schedule C self-employed individuals, um, it's really important to stay on top of that. So you don't have any interest or penalties or anything like that at the end of the year, if you do end up owing, um, that tax season. Um, I mean, the... The nice thing about the S Corp is, you know, even if you make $120,000, um, you can, you know, claim a little bit more than just like the home office deduction that you would if you were a self-employed individual. There's a lot more benefits to do it, but it's really a personal preference and a comfortable, if you're really established, just kind of where I say, okay, you know, you've been consistently um, a Schedule C LLC person for the last like several years. You don't seem like you're going anywhere and you've made pretty much the same amount of money each year, if not more, hopefully more. Um, and then, you know, I might advise like, hey, I think maybe we should do an S Corp and file quarterly and do it like this. Um, but there's not really like a magic number where it's like, oh, you definitely need to do it. It's really personal and comfortable <laughs> for that individual. Nice. That's good to know. Uh, Mary, what... Do you have, if I may ask, do you have an LLC or an S Corp? And so I am an S Corp and I became an S Corp in January, 2020. Okay. So just last year, that's yeah. cool. No. So for your, your personal bookkeeping and record keeping, how much more difficult was it to keep track of LLC type paperwork as compared to now S Corp paperwork? Well, I wasn't an LLC. I was just completely independent and then went straight to an S Corp or, you know, LLC with S Corp designation. I might be a different case because like my greatest joy is budgeting every night or whatever. <laughs> so um, my account, I have an accountant and he offers bookkeeping, but I said, no, I want to do it. I'll be sad if I don't get to do it. Uh, so I don't consider it harder at all, but what I did was just purchase QuickBooks payroll to set up all my own payroll. Um, I have one contractor, so I direct deposit to them through my QuickBooks as well. Um, and I just go through and categorize my transactions. And then QuickBook payroll was very simple for me to send info to my accountant because I get like a detailed profit and loss where he can click and it opens all the transactions. And I just excessively label everything as specifically as I can. And then he can go decide like what's what. Um, so I just do that. I do it at least once a week. I just go through and exclude things that are like personal or if I accidentally use my personal card to buy something for work, I just add it in and super easy. Yeah, if you do it once a week, then you're not forgetting to do it. No, these are great tips because I mean, even for myself, I'm not, I'm definitely not as stringent with my budgeting savvy mm -hmm. as you. So even I'm thinking the one time a week thing is a good, good tip. I like that. <laughs> yeah, and I use uh, QuickBooks payroll is what I use for work. And then I use YNAB, which is you need a budget.com for personal. Um, and then I just do both and they match and everything makes sense. <laughs> YNAB, let me type that in. Yeah. I might be able to give you a discount, like referral code if you want to join it, Lotus. So just let me know. I, I have to look it up. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, as many things to help us keep organized as possible. So speaking of that and record keeping, what are other apps or tools that you guys recommend to help people uh, get their stuff together, you know, keep themselves organized? Not everyone is as blessed as Mary to have that natural organizing bug and gene inside of themselves. Mm -hmm. So what do you really recommend for people that are scatterbrained, that are all over themselves, that have like a million things going on and you know, need to help get focused. Yeah, Mary, go you ahead. You don't mind me butting in. So the organization thing is funny. I have an extremely bad case of ADHD. So organization is absolutely not a strong point, but using a tool like QuickBooks Payroll, where it's kind of like, like spoon fed to you, like click this. And then it's like, now you have to do this. So when I created my S Corp, you go through and you set up your stuff and it tells you all the things you have to file. And it kind of like brings you through very simple steps. Um, so as someone who, like has issues with focusing and organization and executive dysfunction, I highly recommend QuickBooks payroll or any of the QuickBooks, whatever specifically helps you. Yeah, no, that's great to know. That's great to know. Cause sometimes I think people hear these, these names of these things and they're like, oh, that's, 
I can't, I can't get my mind to focus on something like QuickBooks. I'm too all over the place. So that's great to know. Um, yeah. Any, any other apps or tools that you guys recommend, Jesse or Lauren? Um, well, I'm looking up because I have a shoebox full of receipts for one of my clients for the entire year, um, including their bank statements to kind of reflect that. Um, I mean, as long as you have receipts and are able to kind of maintain, if you're super unorganized and you have a good taxpayer or bookkeeper who's willing to spend the time to go through it all, as long as you keep everything somewhere where you know where it is, where we can find it and, you know, generate legitimate um, returns and books for you guys, then it's, it's fine. Um, some taxpayers aren't as nice as me, but I'm kind of used to the, uh, you know, artsy, quirky people. I've done comedians and musicians for years and they just throw stuff together and hand it in. Um, but obviously we love people like Mary who are way more in tune and in touch. And I cannot speak more about QuickBooks and how user-friendly it is. Um, I only use Intuit products, even in my own practice. Um, my tax preparer software is an Intuit product, just like QuickBooks is. So if you do use QuickBooks and you happen to work with me, I can pull everything right off of there and it makes my life so much easier. So yeah, QuickBooks is amazing. All right. You guys hear that? QuickBooks is the thing to get with it. <laughs> and, and Jesse, did you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, I would just say, again, also QuickBooks is amazing, but like the best feature I think for people on the go with QuickBooks is they have a phone app. So you don't have to save those receipts. You can literally take a picture of that receipt with your phone and it just uploads it straight to your QuickBooks. So then you can throw it away because receipts do get faded and that sort of stuff. And also paying someone to go through all of those receipts can get pretty expensive. So just having it that way so it's in there is, is great. And then make sure you're tracking your mileage. Like there are hundreds of apps for mileage tracking which is um, really great. And you can also hook your bank accounts right up to QuickBooks. So that way it's importing those transactions. Just make sure that you're categorizing them correctly. And um, I think it's really important with QuickBooks when it's an amazing tool, but that you get the tool set up right and you get the right level for you. Because if you set up QuickBooks wrong, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to have someone go in and fix it in the back end. So just, maybe spend that little bit of money to get someone to help you set it up in the first place if that's not something you're super comfortable with. When you mean set it up, like choose what type of QuickBooks account to get, is that what you mean? Like, are there different levels or, or what, what do you mean specifically by set it up wrong? So there's a chart of accounts in QuickBooks and there's things in QuickBooks, like it says meals and entertainment, right? In QuickBooks, entertainment isn't a good, uh-oh, we lost Lotus. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'll keep going until she gets back. So with QuickBooks, like it has the, uh, the chart of accounts. So you want to make sure your chart of accounts are set up. And then also QuickBooks has the ability to create rules, which will auto sort those transactions that are regular for you. And if you can set those rules up, it makes it so much less work for you to keep engaging in on a weekly basis. Uh, I can't encourage those enough. Or like I have um, clients who do full service cam work and club work and having those to be designated by classes so they can classify their income and classify their expense and each one they can then see which branch of that income is actually bringing in the most money that way they can dedicate the most time to that branch of income i really love that aspect of what you just described because so many of us are across so many different platforms or even in real life, in person kind of ways of taking in money. And it does get to be kind of hectic trying to figure out exactly where you're making the most money unless you are very, very budget friendly and, and on top of your numbers, but that's good to know. So yeah, QuickBooks, everyone get on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, if there are any questions in the audience, um, feel free to type them into the Q&A part part of the screen at the very bottom, or you can type them into the chat. Um, let's see. I know that there were questions about the difference between a financial advisor and maybe a bookkeeper or, or what exactly is the best way for people to kind of keep, if 
they're not going to do it themselves who who would be the best kind of person to find help with i know lauren you said you're a financial advisor and you're a bookkeeper jesse but there, there's always questions about who is the best person to go to for these kinds of things. Right. Lauren, you want to you wanna start with that one? You've got much more um, life. Sure. I mean, I think to help you get organized and set up, bookkeepers are absolutely amazing. Um, bookkeepers tend to spend almost all of their time on QuickBooks um, or whatever app that they prefer to use, where I spend more of my time actually advising people, consulting people, and then actually preparing tax returns. I do have a few bookkeeping clients that I keep on, but I don't like doing bookkeeping. I would much rather prepare taxes. Um, so I think if you're looking to get more organized, um, definitely get with a bookkeeper and have them assist you with the whole process. Like Jesse was saying, getting your chart of account set up properly, make sure you are getting the right QuickBooks. I think there's four different versions that you can get um, and as long as you get everything set up and organized properly, when you come to somebody like me to actually prepare your taxes, it's a lot smoother process and won't charge you as much to go through your entire shoe box. Um, you know, and so it definitely makes it a lot easier for people like me if you have a legitimate and a good bookkeeper who knows what they're doing and can stay on top of everything for you. Right, sounds great. And um, really quick, what is an average uh, tax season cost someone that's an independent person? Maybe they don't have um, children or anything. Um, you know, some people kind of hold off paying taxes or getting their taxes done because they have no idea what, what the average cost is to pay a tax preparer. So what would that be? What is the range? <laughs> for people to have an understanding of what they will be paying. Cause I've heard many people say, I got quoted this much, is this right? Am I getting cheated or, you know, those kind of just to get a range. <laughs> I feel like a lot of tax preparers overcharge for tax returns. Um, I've been told a lot over my 16 years that I don't charge enough. Um, but <laughs> um, I mean, I know some tax preparers will do a Schedule C tax return if things are organized enough and there's only one Schedule C for as low as $150. I've seen others that say, oh, I won't even look at it for less than $300 or even four. Um, so it kind of depends on your tax preparer. It also depends on the market of where you're at. Um, you know, if there's a lot of tax preparers in that area, there might be some people that charge, you know, way less to try to get the business in. Um, you know, so it, it really varies. Right. Um, and, you know, places like um, the standalone temporary, um, I'm trying not to name drop because I don't want to get in trouble, um, but the standalone temporary like um, pop-ups that we see a lot during tax time, um, I just want to put it out there that they tend to overcharge. They do offer things um, it feels very convenient being on every corner all of a sudden at tax season, right? Yes, yeah. No, it's very convenient, but they tend to way overcharge. They do offer a lot of programs, um, you know, where you can like get a refund advance. Um, a lot of tax preparers can now do that as well. Um, I know Intuit offered that service to us this year if we wanted to opt in. Um, but, you know, they do offer, you know, the like little cards and you can get your refund advance within a week after filing. Um, they have lots of great things, but they tend to overcharge. And unfortunately, the majority of the people that work at those places are not tax repairs. They are not licensed. Um, they're yeah. only required to have one licensed person as the manager. The other people just learn how to uh, do basic data entry into their computers. So wow. they tend to miss out on a lot of credits and stuff like that and then they charge you double of what somebody like me would charge you right i've heard um, of like 700 dollars sometimes that's just insane to me it's just not cost that that's much to file your tax return <laughs> yeah no but yeah i've definitely heard of that um jesse what would you say is kind of the average cost that people could expect to pay a bookkeeper if they're going to have someone take care of their their um their numbers and receipts like that? There's kind of two different uh, systems of billing that bookkeepers use. They use an hourly or a subscription and ancillary benefit situation. I do the subscription with ancillary benefits. Um, so I can't really speak to the hour 
hourlies, but you're looking somewhere between usually 60 to 200 an hour for an average. Um, for me, I work on a either a monthly basis where it's $150 a month and that puts me at your disposal the whole time. I reconcile and do your bookkeeping. Um, I've been told that that's low, but I don't really know because bookkeepers are one of those like tax accountants that are not super great at sharing their prices around because uh, I don't know if they think that it's going to, well, I think it's gonna reveal a lot about each person and their profession. <laughs> so publicizing prices is really important, I think. And it's <laughs> speaking to those pop-ups, stay away from them, please. Stay away. There's so much that we see come through and advertising to our industry specifically, I think uh, is more of a con to take advantage of people who don't feel like they have all of the resources of normal people to uh, fight back when taking advantage of. And I see that all the time and they drop the ball all the time and it's horrific and they have no accountability. And there's so much of that tiny fine print that you just sign away at the beginning of it that you don't even realize that you're, you're signing away any liability. Find a smaller tax preparer, find somebody who does this year after year or a bookkeeper who knows what's going on. Um, I, I would also like to say that bookkeepers, specifically me, when I start with a new client, I start with what their, their goals are, their financial goals, and try and set up their bookkeeping to reflect that. Um, and then just a couple topics back, we had also talked about what makes you a sole proprietor. And Lauren, you had mentioned anyone who got, gets a 1099. Um, but even if you don't get a 1099, like a lot of us work on just a cash basis sort of situation and clubs are notoriously terrible for getting people 1099s. Um, so you're still a sole proprietor, even if you don't get a 1099. Um, but if you do get a 1099 from your club, make sure you talk to them about how they're accounting that. Like, are they including your stage fees that you're paying out in that? Or are they taking it out before they give you your 1099 information? That's all stuff that's really important when you're filing your taxes, because you don't want to take that double deduction. That'll get you popped um, with red flags by the IRS and that sort of thing. So just make sure that you're, you're asking where your financial information is coming from and double check it against your own records. I know OnlyFans had a big problem with their 1099s this last year not being super fluid with the amounts that they had been reporting to their performers and the amounts were off. So just check your own numbers against their numbers. Very good advice. All right, so yes, Mary, did you have something to add on to that? Please yeah, go. one thing I wanted to add is uh, just advice for when searching for like a bookkeeper or accountant to help you is I look for someone who runs their own business independently. So I found an accountant who just runs his own, I don't know what to call it, like accounting business because then you're a big client to a small person and you're not gonna get lost in a sea of people at a large crappy tax thing. Um, and then if you're worried about the cost, if you can afford what you're quoted, I would recommend going forth with an accountant or a bookkeeper at least one time because the amount of money I saved once I got professional help was you know, 10 times the amount I paid them for the service. Uh, so if you can afford it, I'd say just go for it. Find someone you feel comfortable with and just pay it at least one year. <laughs> yeah, oh, good advice. Uh, definitely um, the independent route. Yeah, I've worked with those pop-ups before in the past and not good. <laughs> anyway, um, so Ella Darling asks, do you have to have a business bank account to use the PPP loan specifically? You don't necessarily have to. Um, it definitely, like Jesse was explaining earlier, um, it's definitely a lot easier. If you have your PPP loan sent to your bank and then take out 60% of that and then send it to your personal, that one transaction when you present that to them for the loan forgiveness, um, will qualify you for that forgiveness. You don't necessarily have to, it's just a little bit more um, paperwork on your end and making sure that you are accounting for all of the things that do qualify you for the forgiveness. Um, so you just have to make sure that you're keeping track and running it all through that one account so that you can prove it later on. So if there's no business bank account, like if they got the money, would like transferring it to a savings account be like qualify as like, that's yeah. my personal 
money. Yes. Okay. Got you. Got you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because maybe some people have I would to. Just tell you, I mean, sixty percent will definitely yeah. qualify you if you're taking an owner's draw of that amount. Um, and then you can also, like I said, you can use it for rent, utilities, um, any operational expense that you may need. Say you need a new computer because your computer died and you're a cam girl. Um, you know, that's a necessary operational expense that would actually qualify you for the loan forgiveness. Got you. That's great to hear. Um, so yeah, also another question kind of in relation to those pop-up tax places, the, in, this is in reference to the online tax kind of prep, prep companies, would TurboTax be a good or a bad idea? I like um, So... As somebody who has also worked for TurboTax, um, I, and again, they're an Intuit company that is linked up with QuickBooks as well. Um, I love TurboTax even as a tax preparer, um, but I, I did find working for them um, and also assisting some people who started theirs on TurboTax and said, I'm totally lost and I feel like I'm missing this credit. Can you please look at it? There's a lot that TurboTax misses when it comes to special credits and deductions. Um, they are very user-friendly. So if you don't feel like paying a tax person um, to prepare your stuff, then you can more than welcome sit down and do it. But a lot of times you might not get the refund amount or all the credits to lower your tax liability if you're using something like TurboTax or h and Block Online. And that's just from my personal experience because I've worked for them so <laughs> that's yeah. why the thumbs down for me is as a performer who I do a lot of research on Google and I try really hard to make sure I get all the deductions mm -hmm. I still was paying 25 percent or 30 percent of my income in taxes during using TurboTax because I just couldn't figure out how to deduct certain things and then it tells you that you can't deduct certain things so as like a novice performer I would just if you can afford it pay someone at least once because I couldn't, even though I really love budgeting, I couldn't figure out how to save myself that much money through TurboTax. Mm -hmm. That's and good. Ha having a good bookkeeping base also makes TurboTax easier to use. Like there are some people who have very, very simple returns that I don't know if they necessarily even need a tax preparer if they're making like 15 grand. Like mm -hmm. going to a tax preparer is kind of, you know, like meh. Just make sure that you have good records and good bookkeeping going forward. And then when you do get to a point where you can't afford a tax preparer, you're like, oh, well, I do need that deduction. Definitely see a professional in our industry who can help you with that. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, I turn away clients all the time where I'm like, you know, I feel really bad and guilty taking your money from you to do this tax return when I know you're intelligent enough and organized enough to just go on TurboTax and file it for free. Um, because there are, you know, all the free um, filing ability, you have to meet the income limitation um, and all of that. And then a lot of people even with Schedule C's can file for free if they make under, I think it was 32, isn't it? I think it's 32. But I haven't checked this year. Um, so yeah, but there, you know, a lot of people can free file. So yeah, if your income isn't that much, then I feel bad taking the money from those people. I'm like, <laughs> just, just go on TurboTax. You'll be okay. You know, and you should at least talk to someone that's going to be honest enough with you like that. Unlike those <laughs> pop-up shops, they'll, they'll take yeah, anybody. They'll take anybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the next question from Selena says, um, they're a newbie to the industry and as a creator, they're still learning and it is very overwhelming. They're not LLC registered and they're learning about what it means to be self-employed. What do you recommend that they first focus on getting together this first year of filing with a preparer? That's more of like a bookkeeping question, but do you want me to go for it? <laughs> because I'm fine with it too. <laughs> I was honestly waiting for Jesse. I was like, oh, she's got this. <laughs> so, um, so for me, the first thing I would set up is your EIN because it's free. Um, and then after getting your EIN, I would get your state license and then I would get your city license and then I would get your business bank account. Those are the sort of things. Then I would decide what sort of, what are your goals 
from that point? Like, is your goal to make the most amount of money? Is your goal to pay the least amount of taxes? Are you looking to buy a home or a car or clean up your credit? All of those make a difference in how your money is going to be directed. And there are things like, you know, like if you're buying a home, different states have different tax shelters essentially for making that income tax free or different programs for like saving for college or saving for your kids or daycare. Like there's, there's so many different avenues to go through. And that's why it is important to talk to someone right off the bat to figure out where you're headed financially and what to get together for Lauren to do her job the best that she can do and set up that app or software for you with those goals in mind. I know a lot of people that I work with are um, worried about losing their state-sponsored benefits, mm. so get free healthcare. So that's something that we, we really need to work on is being like, okay, well, you can make up to this much money you know, on your books. So we need to figure out how that's gonna, you know, where we can put the rest of that money that's going to be tax-free or money earned that doesn't necessarily affect that bottom line of that income requirement. Those are things that are really important. Yes, especially with people getting government help in unemployment or child support, things of that nature. Yes, got you. Um, Thank you so much. Um, if there are any more questions from the audience, please let them be known now. Um, we are getting close to the end of our panel. Um, and I definitely want to give our panelists time to advertise their business if they want to share their website or ways to get a hold of them if you want to actually um, inquire about them for your business. Um, Jesse, please take it away. Um, so <laughs> I just saw a comment in the chat that I want to address too. Oh, about, maybe I missed one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so many said something about um, having a disability. And I just want to let you know, there was just a law passed about student loan debt that everybody who has a disability should really pay attention to because it's possible that you can write off your entire student loan debt if you have a disability. So look into that because that's super brand new and very important. Um, and I think a lot of us in the sex worker industry have disabilities. And, and student loan debt. <laughs> yeah, and student loan debt, yeah. So, <laughs> so be aware of that. Um, so I'm Jesse. I own Nerds for Numbers. Uh, my website is nerdsfornumbers.net. I really like to help people get started in this industry with legitimizing themselves and beginning on the right path. Um, my normal setup fee is $375, which kind of helps me walk you through setting up your EIN, your state registration, your city registration, your QuickBooks, teaching you how to use all of that, that sort of stuff. And then if you felt that you needed more help than that on a month to month basis, I charge usually $150 to $500, depending on what your business structures are like. Um, a month. All of my pricing is clear and transparent on my website. Um, I use sex work to start my business, so I know how it can be a great stepping stone or it can be a lifelong career, depending on how you want to work that. And I just want to be more informative so that way you feel empowered to ask those extra questions or push those deductions. Even if you do work with someone outside of the industry, I want you to be confident in your earnings and be able to tell people, you know, I make this much money even after my expenses and not have that question hanging over your head of like, how much am I really making? Cause that's, nobody's comfortable with that. Like you want to buy that house or that car or go on vacation and feel confident in your ability to do that. And I want to be that person for you. <laughs> hey, I love it. Okay. Uh, Lauren, go ahead yes. and what you offer and all about your business. <laughs> so I'm Lauren Fumigali. I'm an enrolled agent with the IRS. Um, I own FumigaliTax.com. I will type it in the chat because nobody can spell Fumigali. Um, <laughs> I have worked with industry folks in self-employment. I specialize in self-employment all around the board, not just with um, sex workers. Um, and I have to stay up to date on my CE courses. So I have to take all of the classes and know all about the new credits and deductions and forms, all that fun stuff. Um, and my prices do vary a little bit depending on the client and what their needs are. But 
Um, I'm really upfront about it. We talk about it beforehand. I have free consultation. So anytime a client needs a question and asked or anything like that, um, I completely consult for free. And then at that point, we'll go over all your stuff and we'll say, okay, this is how much it's going to cost to prepare your tax return. Um, and if things change drastically over the year, I assist with helping with quarterly filings, saying, okay, this is how much you need for your estimated tax payments. Um, you know, I do all sorts of stuff. So I'm kind of a go-to for anybody who has a financial question. Um, and I also assist with setting up stuff like IRAs and any other kind of um, savings accounts for the future. Good to know, because we don't often think of a retirement or a future in our industry unless something tragic happens or something sudden happens that makes us have to stop. And that's really good to know that even in our profession as free and as open and as wild as it is, that there are ways and avenues for us to still have legitimate um, setups and cushions for ourselves, much like the traditional employment that we hear about. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I know. Yeah. I, I honestly, um, I have to think everything um, I, all my thanks goes to my father. Um, of course, you know, wasn't the most excited when he found out what I was doing back in the day, but he said, look, here's the deal. You're going to send me 20% of everything you make and I'm going to invest it for you. And we're going to set up an IRA for you. And we're going to have all this. So you have a retirement fund, you have money when you're done doing this. And, um, you know, I was able to build my entire accounting firm on it. Um, and you know, so I'm grateful for that. Well, yeah. I want to provide that for other people too. You know, I think yeah. it's really important to have somebody that you feel comfortable talking to that uh, to about all of this, you know, because eventually porn will end or your sex work, whatever you choose to do it will end. And, you know, you don't want to have nothing to show for it, especially with how emotionally draining it can be sometimes, you know, in our industries. Um, you know, you definitely want to be proud of what you've done and have something to show for it at the end. So. I want to help people because I'm great. I love I love what you both have just said because we couldn't have brought together two more perfectly suited panelists uh, to speak to us about this. Um, doing our taxes, taking care of our numbers and all of that is so daunting, so scary. So, mm -hmm. you know, so much for so many people and just hearing the passion that you both have from having done um, our job previously, we, you know, that's it's always a matter of trust. So thank you so much for bringing all of this very helpful information. And last but not least, please, Mary, let us know about your Twitter feed is one of the most valuable things in our industry right now. You keep so many people abreast of everything that's going on um, from different studios to our actual legislation trying to take advantage of us and take us down. Like, please tell us about um, the different accounts that you manage and what we should be paying attention to. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Twitter. Sorry, my dog might bark the mail that just got delivered. But uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned Twitter because I was taking notes to then go Google things and tweet all the information later <laughs> from this panel. So I like to go into notes and I have to Google it to make sure I get the right wording or info. Um, so I can put my Twitter in chat. I don't necessarily tweet a lot about mm -hmm. taxes, uh, more about legal issues and in the industry and what is happening legally that also, the uh, information about the disability ability to write off student loans, I'll be looking that up and probably tweeting about it too, because a huge amount of sex workers uh, are disabled or similar. Um, yeah, I put my Twitter in chat. I don't know. I just tweet about everything I find out that I think is important that goes around the laws around sex work in California and in the United States and I don't know, anything I find that's helpful. Love it. Oh, and Lauren, real quick, please drop your website into the chat before we close out so that way people know how to access you easily. And yeah, thank you so much, um, everybody that came to watch and listen to these very knowledgeable panelists spend their time with us. Um, and thank you so much for also sharing that with us. Um, couldn't be more grateful for how this went. Um, for anybody that has friends that missed the panel, let them know we will definitely be uploading this to our website, freespeechcoalition.com, or also our YouTube uh, at Free Speech Coalition or FSC. So look it up, follow us. We have all our, our panels up there later on. And yeah, everyone have just a wonderful Thursday and feel more confident with your tax prep now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys. Yes, thank you.